Welcome to the first of three Summer Stars lectures in 2021. Um, as you probably know by now, the director established this lecture series last year with the goal of featuring diverse viewpoints, focusing on the intersection of nature, our humanity, science, sustainability, the earth. Uh, in other words, something inspirational from very creative, impactful people, but very far from our typical science talk. Um, the series title was inspired by summer nights when I was a child lying in meadows and on rocks looking at the stars with my dad, who was a naturalist. And uh, this year we have three inspiring speakers lined up. They are Jeff Green, a Canadian who is a global leader in polar education and youth engagement um, and the founder of the Students on Ice Foundation. The second will be is Bernard Ferguson, who's a Bahamian poet and essayist whose work focuses on issues of climate change, justice, and equity. And today, our first speaker is Dr. John Cook, an author and cartoonist from Australia. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, John Cook, who is a research fellow at the Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University in Australia. So John earned his PhD in cognitive science at the University of Western Australia in 2016. I've known of John's work since 2007 when he founded Skeptical Science, a website praised for its straightforwardness in countering climate misinformation. It has been described as, quote, the most prominent knowledge-based website dealing with climate change in the world and the Washington Post has praised it as, quote, the most prominent and detailed website to counter arguments by global warming deniers. In September of 2011, the site won the Eureka Prize from the Australian Museum in the category of advancement of climate change knowledge. To this day, I refer to this website regularly. John has also co-authored a number of college textbooks, including Climate Change and Examining the Facts, and he was also co-author of the textbook climate change science, modern synthesis, and climate change denial, heads in the sand. In 2013, he published a paper analyzing the scientific consensus on climate change. This is the 97% paper, which I'm sure many of us remember, one that has been highlighted by President Obama, UK Prime Minister David Cameron, amongst many others. I got to know him better after this paper when he drew cartoons of 97 climate scientists and their quotes about climate for the 97 hours of consensus campaign. In 2015, he developed a massive open online course, a MOOC at the University of Queensland, Queensland on climate science denial. And this, is, this course has educated over 25,000 students. And finally, in his latest project, he wrote and drew the cartoons for the book Cranky Uncle versus Climate Change, which I have right here on my desk, John. And he developed a, a smartphone game, Cranky Uncle, that goes along with it, um, which again uses cartoons to counter climate misinformation. And this book is a delight and quite a few of our Lamont and Columbia climate, science call, climate scientist colleagues are, are featured in this book. So John, we are so happy to welcome you to Lamont. I only wish you could be in person, but again, thank you for coming and talking with us today. Very, very much, Mo. Um, <clears throat> delighted to see that you've uh, read the Cranky book too. Um, it, to my shame, I keep forgetting to have a have a copy near me whenever I'm giving Zoom talks. So oh, I'm always whoa. put to shame when other people yeah. do it. If I held it like that, nobody saw it. There we go. <laughs> That's right. And it's. It's reversed. Um, I don't think I used your cartoon in the book too, which is a real shame. I'm, I'm disappointed in myself. Okay, so I'll pass it over to you and I'm gonna stop my video and, and take it away, John. Great, thank you. All right, so I'm sharing my slides now. So my talk um, is titled Scalable Interdisciplinarity, which I acknowledge is a real mouthful. And in fact, interdisciplinarity is not, is one of my least favorite words to say. Eight syllables is way too many. Um, 
but uh, over the last decade and a half of, of working on the issue of climate misinformation, my research has just been uh, pushing me more and more towards um, the, the conclusion that we need interdisciplinary solutions to solve complex problems like climate misinformation or, or climate change itself. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, one, just one interdisciplinary uh, solution that I've been developing. But um, rather than jump right to the punchline, I'm going to kind of take a meandering uh, journey towards that conclusion and, and give you a bit of a, um, a, I guess, somewhat of a personal or professional history on how I got to this point. Uh, and I want to start way back in the early 1990s. This is the day that I got my physics degree at the University of Queensland. Uh, and I'm shaking hands with my dad, who looks very proud and happy at that point. He's probably happy because this is this photo was taken before I informed him that I was leaving physics and academia and I was going to become a cartoonist instead. He was not happy when I broke that news to him. And in fact, I recall him warning me that if I did that, then I would end up living on the streets uh, wearing torn jeans. I think I actually have a cartoon of that moment in the Craig the Uncle book. Um, uh, but part of the reason why I did that was while I was doing my physics degree and I passed, just in case you're wondering, but while during my physics lectures, I was often drawing cartoons in the margins of my uh, notes. So um, I still keep some of my physics lecture notes in a box somewhere. And you can see all these little doodles down the uh, sides of the notes. Uh, and so I decided to give that a try after my after completing my honours year uh, at the University of Queensland. And for the next decade or so, I worked full time as a cartoonist. But uh, funnily enough, uh, I found that while I was working, my day job was drawing cartoons. Uh, in my spare time, I started doing science again uh, and actually started getting more and more interested in the issue of climate change. And uh, eventually that culminated in 2007 when I launched the uh, Skeptical Science website. And the goal of this website is pretty straightforward. Uh, we debunk misinformation about climate change with peer-reviewed science. I uh, went into this website, my whole communication approach was based on my physical science background. I assume that uh, if you explain the facts to people, that should be sufficient. That should be enough to uh, counter misinformation and, and deal with the issue of, of climate science denial. Uh, and uh, it turns out that that was somewhat of a naive assumption. Um, and you can see in the right uh, of the, the right margin of this uh, screenshot, um, I think it was about 2014 was when, I um, launched a public engagement campaign, which we called the 97 Hours of Consensus. So even while I was focused on skeptical science and climate communication, still I was, I was had feet in both worlds, both, both uh, science and, and art. And I was using cartoons to, to try to engage the public about uh, climate change. Uh, and what was involved in the 97 Hours of Consensus was every hour, for 97 consecutive hours, we would post uh, or just tweet and post on Facebook uh, caricatures of scientists. Um, and and we, we um, searched all through the internet and found really good, um, strong, concise quotes about the reality of climate change from, from the world's leading climate scientists. Uh, and then I drew them, and then I asked the scientists if they were okay with me drawing them. And uh, um, Professor Ramo here uh, was very generous in letting me uh, use her caricature in our 97 Hours campaign. And it ended up being one of the, um, the most successful public engagement campaigns that we did over the history of skeptical science. We got millions of impressions on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and if, I think it was probably the only thing I've ever done that didn't have climate deniers complaining and attacking it. Um, it's hard to get cranky at cartoons, I guess. 
Uh, but oh, let me just go back a second. Now, while I was um, doing skeptical science for the first couple of years, uh, people would start sending me suggestions on ways that I could do it better, which there always was, and there still is. Uh, there's always room for improvement. But several years into doing skeptical science, uh, I received an email from a cognitive scientist from the University of Western Australia, Stefan Lewandowski. And he emailed me some psychological research about debunking and misinformation. And what this research found published in, in 2007 was that if you debunk misinformation in the wrong way, there was a risk that you could inadvertently reinforce the myth and cause a backfire effect. And when I looked at how skeptical science was debunking misinformation and compared that to the bad format of debunking in this research, they were the same. My, the, my um, debunkings started with a headline which repeated the myth in a short, concise, um, sticky kind of way. Then it repeated the myth again before going into a long detailed uh, debunking. And the danger of this was it was making the myth more prominent than the facts. Uh, and I, I vividly remember reading this research with the blood draining from my face, thinking, oh my God, am I making things worse with skeptical science? Um, and I just want to digress for a moment, just to um, uh, talk a little bit about this, this idea of backfire effects. Um, because while this research got a lot of attention back in 2007, and there were a handful, uh, a couple of studies that found backfire effects, in the decade plus since that time, uh, researchers have tried to replicate the backfire effect and really struggled to do it. Uh, it's this rare phenomenon um, that doesn't happen very often uh, in experimental research. And uh, this, this was um, one of the driving forces why late last year I uh, got together with uh, two dozen of the world's leading researchers into debunking misinformation, and we published the Debunking Handbook 2020. And one of the key uh, messages from this was that the backfire effect is not the boogeyman that um, people have been making it out to be uh, recently, uh, and it's it can be as even as bad as people using the fear of the backfire effect to not engage with misinformation or not debunk misinformation out of fear that it might um, cause a backfire, might, might reinforce the myth. Uh, even uh, Facebook used the backfire effect as an excuse for not responding to misinformation flowing through their platform at one point. And so we wanted to set the record straight that uh, while there were these early studies, the overall um, balance of evidence from, from the research was that it was not, it was not a significant effect um, and usually failed to replicate. And the far greater danger was failing to engage with misinformation and leaving it unchallenged. I just wanted to um, set the record straight there because I, I wouldn't want to inadvertently reinforce the, the um, the fear of the backfire effect that, that some people have. So getting back to the point. Um, so so uh, this email that I received from Stefan Lewandowski about the psychology of debunking was, it turned out a life-changing email. It, it opened my eyes to the fact that there was a science to science communication. And I immediately started diving into the literature and trying to learn as much as I could about the psychology of debunking. And that uh, led me to starting a PhD at the University of Western Australia, studying, um, doing research into debunking myself. Uh, and this was one of the papers or, um, that was published from research that I did during my PhD. Uh, and my, my research was really focused on what are effective ways of countering misinformation. Uh, and the answer that I came out of my PhD with was inoculation. Uh, inoculation is a um, branch of psychological research that uh, I actually discovered when I was presenting the results of this research at the uh, University of New South Wales in Sydney. 
Um, I have not heard of inoculation, but it turns out that's what I was doing in this experiment. And then a professor in the front row of, of the room said, what you're doing sounds a lot like inoculation theory. It turns out that the thing that I thought I'd discovered had been discovered uh, over half a century ago. And inoculation theory basically takes the idea of vaccination and applies it to knowledge. Researchers have found that um, when you expose people to a weakened form of misinformation, that builds up their immunity, their resilience, their um, cognitive antibodies, if you will, uh, so that when they encounter the actual misinformation, they're less likely to be misled. And so let me um, probably make it a bit more tangible and concrete by describing what we did in this experiment. Um, uh, we ran an experiment where we showed people misinformation about climate change, and we took verbatim um, text from a website called the Global Warming Petition Project. This um, is actually one of the most potent forms of climate misinformation that's been tested uh, in, in lab experiments. There was a different experiment by Sander van der Linden who tested half a dozen climate maps. And this was the one that had the biggest effect in reducing people's uh, attitudes about climate change or their perceptions. And the, the point of the petition project is to argue 31,000 um, Americans with a science degree have signed this statement saying that humans aren't disrupting climate. And uh, that therefore the conclusion is that there's no scientific consensus on human caused global warming. So in my experiment, I showed people the Global Warming Petition Project and then measured the impact of people reading this climate misinformation. This is the results. Um, the horizontal axis in this graph is political ideology. So people to the right are more right-wing, people to the left are more left-wing. And what I found was climate misinformation um, affects different parts of the population differently. The more politically conservative people are, the bigger the impact of the misinformation. Uh, and what this means is A, the overall effect is negative. So misinformation does work. It reduces people's climate perceptions, their acceptance that global warming is happening and human cause, and it reduces their support for climate action. Uh, but the second thing that climate misinformation does is it polarizes the public because people are affected differently depending on where they sit on the political spectrum. That means that as misinformation washes over society, people get pulled apart and they become even more polarized. Uh, and so this polarizing influence is really problematic. Uh, it makes it harder to get progress, like societal progress on an issue. And I'll, I'll come back to this challenge a little later in this presentation. So um, in my experiment, one group were, were shown only the misinformation, but a second group were also shown an inoculating message before they were shown the misinformation. And this is an excerpt of my inoculation. Basically, the approach I took in this inoculation was to explain the technique used to mislead in the misinformation. And in this case, um, there are a number of techniques in the Global Warming Petition Project, but the main one is fake experts or argument from false authority. The 31,000 signatories of the Global Warming Petition Project are anyone with a science degree, and that's any science degree. So what you see in this list are computer scientists, medical scientists, veterinary scientists, engineers, but very few with uh, any actual expertise in climate science. And in my inoculation message, I didn't mention the Global Warming Petition Project at all. Instead, I spoke in general terms about the fake expert strategy, and I used tobacco misinformation as an analogy, as an example of that strategy. And what I found was when I inoculated people by explaining the technique used to mislead, um, 
overall, it, it neutralized the misinformation. There's a slight slope to this blue line, the inoculated group, but the um, statistically, it's equivalent to a flat horizontal zero line. Um, basically, the misinformation neutralized, sorry, the inoculation neutralized the misinformation. And importantly, it happened across the political spectrum. So what that tells us uh, is two things. Firstly, nobody likes being misled, whether you're politically conservative or liberal. Uh, if you have the misleading techniques explained to you, those techniques uh, are no longer effective in misleading you. It's like exposing the um, sleight of hand that a magician uses to trick people. Secondly, you can inoculate people against misinformation without having to specifically mention it by explaining techniques of misinformation in general terms that can inoculate them against specific instances. Uh, so this, this approach, which uh, we call logic-based inoculation, explaining inoculating people by explaining the logical flaws in misinformation or logical fallacies, um, it's kind of like a universal vaccine against misinformation because it can grant people immunity across different topics. Uh, and so uh, explaining the techniques of misinformation uh, then became uh, a key focus of my work uh, after this research. Um, other uh, people working in the issue of science denial have documented um, the main techniques uh, of science denial. And uh, so I think it was around 2012, 2013, I was giving a talk to a, a youth climate summit. Um, and wanting to kind of make it easy to help help them remember these five techniques of denial, uh, I came up with the acronym FLIC. Uh, then in 2015, we uh, released a massive open online course, which um, uh, Murray mentioned earlier. And so I started to expand this uh, framework of the techniques of science denial, adding some subcategories of different logical fallacies and um, different uh, variations on the fake expert strategy. Uh, and since 2015, over the last half decade, I've continued to build up this, this uh, landscape of different techniques of science denial. Uh, and it's becoming quite a bloated taxonomy now. Uh, this isn't comprehensive either. There's, there's still more to be added, but it just takes, takes time <laughs> to add them. And uh, it's, there are a lot of techniques of science denial that are that are being used in not just climate misinformation, but in, in all uh, forms of misinformation and documenting them. And then more importantly, um, raising public awareness of them is, is quite a challenge. And uh, it's, it's a challenge where, which uh, eventually led me to the, the approach of interdisciplinarity to be able to solve it. Um, so let me jump back again. So, uh, so since uh, documenting the techniques of science denial, uh, my research over the last several years has focused on how do you effectively explain these to people? How, what are effective inoculation strategies? Because uh, there are many different ways that you can do it. It's quite a versatile um, approach. And I've mainly been working with... Um, some of my colleagues at George Mason University, uh, Sojung Kim and Emily Vraga at the University of Minnesota uh, in experimentally testing different ways of inoculating the public against misinformation. Uh, and here is one experiment where we, um, we had uh, George Mason students come into our eye tracking lab and, and look at misinformation and debunkings while we were using eye tracking equipment to see what held their attention. And this is an example of the misinformation. We, we used misinformation across different topics, vaccination, ironically, um, climate change, even uh, gun control um, misinformation. And uh, here is an example where we got our largest effect sizes. So as scientists, we tended to focus more on this one. But uh, in the case of misinformation, casting doubt on the efficacy of vaccination, 
or the safety of vaccination. Um, we uh, published a debunking, like we showed people misinformation and then a tweet um, response uh, debunking it. And it debunked it by um, explaining the, um, the fallacy in the misinformation, in this case, uh, mistaking correlation with causation. And we took a critical thinking approach. We um, uh, explained the fallacy, but then also showed an infographic pointing out where in this argument the logic goes wrong. Uh, but we also tested another way of countering the misinformation, and that was using humor. Uh, for me, it was, I was pretty excited to actually find a way to get cartoons uh, into my scientific experiments. Uh, so I was, again, uh, living with my feet in two worlds at the same time. And, and I have to confess, once we got the experimental data, uh, the first thing I do whenever we do an experiment with cartoons is I have a look at the, um, the survey measure for how funny people find the cartoon. Um, there's not really that much scientific validity other than confirming um, that the funny, the humorous intervention is more humorous than the non-humorous intervention. But as a cartoonist, I also like to just see whether um, uh, statistically my cartoons are funny. And so far the p-values have been well below 0.05. So I may be the only cartoonist to have worked, calculated the p-values of the cartoon's funniness, um, but sorry, I digress. Uh, so this experiment, uh, just if you look very closely, I'll just go backwards and forwards between them. We have a, the humorous condition and the non-humorous condition. The only difference between the two is the image at the bottom of the tweet. Uh, and so really what we were measuring is what happens when people are shown either a non-humorous uh, uh, correction or a humorous correction. And we found that both were equally effective in reducing belief in the misperception that vaccinations cause harm or the HPV vaccination causes these kinds of injuries. Uh, and, and also reducing um, people's perceived credibility of the original misinformation. So both humorous and non-humorous debunkings work. But uh, then we uh, performed mediation analysis to explore why do they work? What is the pathway through which um, these different approaches are effective in debunking the myth? And we found that with the non-humorous condition, the critical thinking approach to debunking misinformation, uh, it had a higher credibility relative to the humorous approach. And that higher credibility was the mediator or the, the mechanism through which the, uh, the debunking was effective uh, in countering the, uh, the misinformation. With the cartoon, uh, using our eye tracking data, we found that uh, it was the increased attention to the image, to the cartoon at the bottom of the tweet that mediated or was the mechanism through which the, the debunking was effective. And so what this research tells us is two things. Firstly, there is no single way to counter misinformation. Different approaches can be effective. Uh, uh, but secondly, there are different approaches are effective through different pathways, through different mechanisms. Uh, and so um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, we need to be open to exploring different approaches and, and also not championing a single approach either. I think uh, there are lots of ways to address misinformation. And this really is a multi-front war where I think we need to be um, taking, taking lots of different approaches at the same time, different messages from different messengers to different audiences. So, uh, well, jumping back again, uh, but one thing my research and these experimental studies found was that the humorous approach was not only effective in countering misinformation, it was also more engaging. The participants were more engaged with, with that content. They were more likely to share it uh, or comment on it or interact with it um, on social media. So it's more likely to go viral. And interestingly, it also provoked more um, what we call information seeking. 
um, people more, uh, it increased a greater intent for people to go looking for more information on the topic afterwards. Uh, and so this spoke to me about some unique benefits of the humorous approach to um, countering misinformation. And so I started putting these approaches into practice. And in uh, well, it was early 2020, uh, published a book uh, that was really a collection of a lot of different cartoons um, uh, explaining climate change, using lots of analogies to explain the science of climate change, but also using cartoons to explain the logical fallacies uh, in misinformation as well. And the approach that the book takes um, is what philosophers call parallel argumentation. The idea of this is taking the logical flaw um, in some misinformation and then transplanting that logic into parallel situations in order to make it obvious where that logic goes wrong, where the misinformation goes wrong. I had this um, approach uh, introduced to me by some critical thinking philosophers. And that was a real light bulb moment for me because I realized that late night comedians use this approach all the time. Uh, they take a something that a public figure said that day, some misinformation, and then they'll just say in their monologue, well, that's just like being in this situation and then using the same logic, but in a more absurd way. And people immediately see how the original misinformation is false. The, the power of this approach is not only that it can be entertaining and accessible and taking abstract logic and making it more concrete, um, but it's, it's also, um, actually those, those are the three main benefits. I think there was a fourth benefit, but uh, it's flying out of my mind right now. Um, but I also realized that parallel arguments um, a perfect delivery mechanism for this approach are cartoons. And that's when I started uh, building up this library of cartoons that culminated in the Cranky Uncle book. So um, once the book was out though, uh, I recognized that there are still these challenges to uh, adequately addressing misinformation that I had yet to solve. Uh, even having gone through a decade of research um, happening upon inoculation, refining the approach of inoculation and putting it into practice, there were still um, three big hurdles to uh, really solving the problem of misinformation at a societal level. Uh, and the first of them was psychological. When you're trying to inoculate people and explain to them the techniques of misinformation, Really what you're trying to do is um, help them become better critical thinkers, help them to be able to assess the logic of arguments, identify fallacies in, in false arguments, um, which is really critical thinking. And the problem is critical thinking is, is difficult. It's effortful um, and it's hard. Uh, and so, um, what I uh, have been working on over the last few years is a critical thinking game that helps train people to become better critical thinkers. And what I realized um, as I was developing this game was um, there are unique elements of gamification that help solve that very fundamental psychological challenge. Uh, so the way the game works um, is you're basically mentored by this cartoon character, the cranky uncle. Um, and what he does is he trains you to become a science denying cranky uncle yourself. Uh, and the game takes you through the flick taxonomy, the five characteristics or techniques of science denial, um, as well as all those subcategories that, that big sprawling taxonomy I showed earlier. And he explains each technique. He um, explains it with text, he, like he just uh, takes you through how each denial technique works. And the game uses parallel arguments. It uses different cartoon analogies to illustrate the flawed logic um, in each uh, logical fallacy or denial technique. And 
and as I said, the game uh, goes through these different um, techniques from the flick taxonomy. But again, as I said earlier, this is a big landscape of, of techniques and the challenge for either communicators or educators or scientists is how do you get the public not only to become aware of these and to understand and remember them, but also internalize them enough that they will be able to spot these techniques out in the wild if they hear a fallacious argument on TV or in social media or even in conversation. And um, the, the whole ch the challenge in being able to achieve this, uh, I think, is really brought forward um, from uh, the book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, in this book, Kahneman talks about uh, two different ways that, that humans think. Uh, the first type of thinking is uh, what he calls fast thinking. Uh, and this is the vast bulk of thinking that people do. Uh, it's quick, instantaneous reactions. We call them mental shortcuts or heuristics. And our brains are really hardwired for fast thinking because over the millions of years of evolution of the human brain, humans survive by reacting quickly. If a predator jumped out of the bushes, we, the ones who reacted instantly survived. And the ones who thought, hmm, that's an interesting conundrum, those are the ones that didn't survive. And consequently, um, the quick thinkers uh, survived to uh, continue the human race and our brains uh, are really based on that type of quick thinking. That's the vast bulk of human psychology. But the second type of thinking that Kahneman talks about is slow thinking. And this is reasoning through problems, doing, uh, solving difficult problems like two-digit by two-digit multiplication or assessing the logical validity of an argument. Slow thinking is effortful uh, and it's difficult. It takes a lot of, uh, it, re it really requires us to stop and reason through problems, and we can do it, but it's not easy and we don't do it that often. Uh, and so the challenge of building public resilience against misinformation is about trying to turn people from fast thinkers to slow thinkers. And so this is that fundamental psychological barrier. So I'm kind of trying to go against the way the human brain is hardwired, and that's, that's hard. But Kahneman also talked about a third type of thinking as well in his book. It's kind of buried away in the, in the middle, but it's uh, incredibly important. Uh, and he calls it expert heuristics. When you have an expert performing a complicated task, something that requires slow thinking, like heart surgery or, or a fireman in a dangerous situation assessing all the conditions and and trying to work out the best uh, response. Um, that requires expertise, training, um, knowledge, and, and slow thinking reasoning. But when an expert has to perform that task over and over and over again, uh, repeatedly practicing it, gradually those slow, difficult tasks become quicker and easier uh, to the point where they can basically solve really complicated problems in, with fast thinking. Uh, they can do it so quickly because they've practiced it over and over again. Uh, and so it's, it's basically like slow thinking that is gradually through practice being converted to fast thinking. And it was while reading this book that I realized that gamification offered, the, um, offered tools to be able to help turn critical thinking from a slow thinking process into a fast thinking response. Uh, because what the game does is it gets players practicing critical thinking. They um, are shown examples of misinformation and they have to identify what is the fallacy in each, in each um, myth example. And then they practice that over and over again. And then the game uses traditional gameplay elements like collecting points and leveling up uh, so that that motivates them, as well as humor and cartoons. All these things are used to motivate players to get further and further into the game because the more they play it, 
the more they practice critical thinking and the more resilient they become against misinformation. The second challenge of misinformation is structural. Climate change is, in, is an incredibly polarized issue, particularly in the US. And uh, that means that me, myself, if I was trying, to, if, even if I came up with the perfect inoculating message and I was trying to get that out to the public, I would mostly be preaching to the choir, the kind of people who follow me on Twitter or Facebook or read skeptical science tend not to be the people who need that information the most. Uh, I'm, I'm reaching people who are already on board. Uh, so how do you reach those siloed communities that, that tend to not follow skeptical science or, um, or go looking for accurate climate misinformation and instead are more vulnerable to misinformation and more exposed to it? Um, while I was developing this game and talking to climate scientists, I was struck by how enthusiastic climate scientists who taught classes were to use the game in their classrooms and um, realized that, uh, that uh, in the classroom was, was possibly the way that the game could have its biggest, uh, deepest and long-term impact. Uh, and so when after the game came out in December 2020, um, we then, uh, I put together a um, teacher's guide to the game, which explained all the research that went behind it, inoculation theory, critical thinking, uh, but also provided a lot, a lot of suggestions for classroom activities that teachers could use to complement the game, to reinforce that critical thinking content and, and created a, um, a form. And you can see the URL at the bottom of the slide here where teachers could sign up, get a group code, which made it quick and easy for their students to get into the game and start playing it. And what I found was uh, very quickly, uh, teachers started signing up and all across the country, red states and blue states. Haven't cracked the decoders yet. I'm really disappointed about that and hoping to, to uh, get in there sooner than later. But um, it, it's, it confirmed my hope that, um, uh, that games as an interactive, engaging educational resource could reach those siloed communities that I otherwise would not be able to reach. Uh, and um, uh, the other thing, just very quickly, uh, over the last couple of weeks, there's been a, an increasing number of German schools that have been signing up to use the game, which I, I can't explain. Um, and the game's only available in English at the moment. We are actually in the process of translating the game and, and creating a multilingual version. And anyone interested in helping us translate, this is a quick plug. Um, please go to the URL at the top of this slide. Uh, and if you want to volunteer to help us translate it, because we're going to, we're going to try to make the game as available uh, in as many different languages as possible. Um, but the other thing that has really um, pleasantly surprised me was the breadth um, of different subjects uh, up for the classes that have adopted the game. I originally thought of it as uh, probably climate science and environmental science classes, um, but it, it turned out to be uh, all different fields of science, biology, chemistry, physics, but even beyond science, um, geometry and mathematics. I would love to see what Cranky Uncle in a geometry class would look like. Um, but also uh, English, ethics, um, uh, psychology, uh, across a whole range of different subjects. Um, basically, wherever there's misinformation, um, building people's critical thinking in order to build their resilience against the misinformation is important. And misinformation is in every subject. So the, the game, it turns out, and I, it seems obvious in hindsight, um, is relevant uh, across all these topics. The other thing that has surprised me has been the, um, the age ranges that have uh, been using the game. I, I Initially, I thought of it as just a, um, a university class game, uh, but then thought, oh, uh, when high school classes started signing up, I thought, well, that's cool. Then middle school and even elementary school uh, classes started signing up, and that surprised me. Um, we're collecting data now to assess how effective the game is at different ages, um, 
haven't got enough data to do proper analysis of that yet, but um, over time, we should have enough data to really see at what age group the, the game is most effective. Um, and lastly, and sorry, I realize that I'm talking a little longer than I expected. Um, uh, very quickly, uh, I talked earlier about polarization and that, that challenge of solving an issue where the public is polarized. And one thing we're going to explore soon with the game is the idea of cranky contests, having groups compete against other groups to collect the most cranky points, or, or even within a class, having students competing against each other. And what excites me about this is it takes um, the one element of human psychology, which is our tribalness, our, our tendency to associate with social groups, uh, which is often a, um, uh, an instinct that leads to bad, bad outcomes. In the case of climate misinformation, tribalness drives polarization, which makes it harder for us to get progress on the issue of climate change. But games can actually use that tribal instinct to motivate people towards positive outcomes. In this case, um, you could use group contests to motivate players to build their own resilience against climate misinformation. So it's almost like competing um, aspects of tribalness. Tribalness can lead to polarization, but it could also lead to um, building resilience against polarizing misinformation. And it will be really interesting to see how that plays out when we integrate that into the game. Um, I'll just finish by um, just um, providing a few links. You can play the game for free on iPhone, Android, and on any browser. Basically anyone with internet access can use it. We wanna make the game as broadly, widely accessible as possible. And lastly, uh, Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or you want to um, uh, you know, discuss discuss my research further. Uh, and you can also find me on on Twitter and on on the web in these different URLs. So I might uh, stop there, and uh, hopefully we have time to answer some questions. Thanks, John. I'm re as I was sitting here chuckling through your talk. I was reminded again of how much we lose in the Zoom world when you're giving a talk to an audience and you just don't hear that feedback coming back. It's very <laughs> hard, I know. So, especially when when you want laughter to come back. <laughs> Our cartoonists live for laughter too. So yeah. I know, I know. It's a big shame. So hopefully everybody's putting in uh, their claps, their compliments. <laughs> their enjoyment of the talk in, into the Q&A box. There are a few questions here. Um, uh, one person asked, can we get a link to the transition translation form again? And maybe maybe we can. Uh, I can put it into the chat window um, with that. Yeah, that everybody would see that. I'll just uh, make sure it just goes to everybody. Yeah. And um, and, and please feel free to ask questions. And someone anonymous asks, thanks so much for this fascinating talk and all your work in this area. Do you have any suggestions um, on how to use these tools to approach family members who may believe misinformation, whether on climate or vaccines? And this inoculation metaphor is incredibly topical, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Uh, in fact, just... Um... Last night I was meeting with some people working on vaccine misinformation and exploring taking this approach and using it to inoculate people against vaccine misinformation, which has a real poeticness to it, I think. Um, I'm, so I'm excited about taking that approach and applying it in a different topic. Although working on vaccination is a little bit out of my comfort zone, but they're the vaccine experts, so that, that's good. Um, there's, I will acknowledge one limitation of the cranky game is we don't yet, I'm hoping that we will, but currently it's, it's more about building your own awareness of the techniques of misinformation. It's really about inoculating yourself so that you don't become a super spreader. Uh, so I, could, I guess you could, if you push the analogy, it could also be like wearing a mask so you're not spreading the virus. Um, what it doesn't do yet 
is train you on how to have a conversation with your cranky uncle. And, I, and I'm really hoping that we will get the opportunity sooner than later to um, expand the game. I'm hoping to add a, a new character, a cordial cousin, who teaches you how to have conversations with your cranky uncle. Uh, but there is literature on this approach. And, and generally speaking, I, what I would recommend, having had conversations with my own father, father-in-law, my own cranky uncles in my family, is approaching those conversations with empathy, um, curiosity, uh, genuinely listening and trying to understand where they're coming from. And I think um, you don't need to be a super um, critical thinking expert to have conversations with your cranky uncle. Uh, with my own father, it was really just having those conversations, being there, and um, over time, I, um, talking about climate change over years, uh, he eventually did change his mind on climate change. He used to be a climate denier, but I, I'm not convinced that it was a killer argument that I gave that changed his mind. I think um, just letting people know that you care about an issue can have an impact um, rather than trying to get into big combative fights about it. Great, great way to think about it. Um, Yana says skepticism has been vilified lately, but I think skepticism is the driving force for scientific progress and learning. Do you think you should be skeptical even if skepticism is often vilified as denialism? And, and I'll say, I love that you owned that word in your website, but I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I, I agree 100% and always have since 2007 when we started the website. Because from a scientist's point of view, skepticism is a good thing. Uh, and I also talk about this in the Cranky Uncle book. Um, I talk about the difference between skepticism and denial, and the two are polar opposites. Skepticism is looking at the evidence first and then coming to a conclusion. Denial is starting with the conclusion and then cherry picking the evidence or denying any evidence that contradicts your beliefs. Uh, and those are polar opposite approaches. So I think that scientists do need to reclaim the word skepticism and, and encourage skeptic, a skeptical approach, which is not about denying or, or being nihilistically skeptical. It's about being evidence-based. Indeed. Um, Carl writes, the frustration frustrating thing about disinformation is that its targets keep returning to the echo chambers where it's disseminated. Is there research that shows that some of the techniques you can describe can survive that re-indoctrination? Yeah, this is a big problem. I've kind of struggled with this too, actually. I probably need to add it as a fourth <laughs> challenge to my list of challenges of misinformation because uh, as a communication researcher, we we do our lab experiments and we test and fine tune our inoculating interventions and we can get it perfect and get it all working and have significant effects on reducing belief in the myth. Um, and we could even get those out to the public and um, have them, uh, you know, debunked. Uh, but then they'll just go back and watch Fox News and, and get bombarded with the fire hose of falsehoods again. And that can undo all the good work that our, um, our efforts have, have tried to have. So, um, yeah, how do you, can, can you build resilience um, against that kind of onslaught? And it's not just the content, it's also all the social cues. Like humans are social animals. So if we see our tribe all belonging, all uh, believing in this one thing, it's incredibly difficult to shift from that. Um, and it's, it's a big disincentive to not shift because if we do change our minds, then we can get ostracized from our society, or from our, our community. Uh, Bob Inglis is a good example of that. The South Carolina Republican congressman who changed his mind on climate change and then got uh, primaried and, and dumped by his own party. And uh, to his, like, I think he's a, a hero and a champion because he's now trying to convince Republicans of the reality of climate change and the need for climate action. Um, but 
you can see that the difficulties when because of that those social dynamics. So I don't think I've got a good answer to that question yet. Um, it's an open question. I have one question, which was, I was really impressed at the diversity of places that your game was being used in classrooms. Uh, was the significance, was there some significance to the blue and the red pins on that? Oh, right. Um, yeah, one was K-12, the other was college. I forget ah. which was which, so, but um, yeah, it's, it's mostly college classes, uh, but a, an impressive mix of um, K-12 schools as well. And there was a handful of green pins, which were just non, like informal education settings. Yeah, okay. I was wondering if that had something to do with liberal and conservative. Um, <laughs> Jim Robertson asks, while the focus in this talk is climate change and vaccines, could and should we be applying these same techniques to other issues we are facing as a society today? There is misinformation across the political and social spectrum. Um, absolutely. And I kind of alluded to that sort of universal aspect of critical thinking. Uh, this really came home for me. Uh, I was talking to a high school teacher who um, was, was teaching climate science and we working with the National Center for Science Education, we developed a curriculum, a climate curriculum for high schools that used Flick that explained the fallacies in climate misinformation. And they went and taught that in their high school science classes, usually either AP environmental science or sometimes it was in biology or, or other science classes. But um, the teacher told me that her students came back to her and said, um, we were in English and the English teacher was showing some false arguments and we said, hey, that's Flick. And they started pointing out the fallacies that they had just learned in their AP environmental science class. And the English teacher thought this really is relevant and, and helpful for what I'm trying to teach. And she started incorporating Flick in her English class. And then when the principal learned that this um, framework was being used across these different subjects, he then started working on having it incorporated across all the subjects across the school. Uh, and so I think that critical thinking is relevant in all subjects uh, and well, or in any subject where misinformation uh, exists and that is all subjects. So there's one more question in the Q&A that you haven't answered if, if you're willing to take one last question. Sure. It's kind of a long one. I'm not even sure I should read the whole thing, but it's, uh, can you read it too? Um, I'm just. Okay. One pushback against scientists is when scientists pretend they know more than they actually know. For example, in climate science, the concept of climate is a variable that requires measurements of several hundred years, which we don't currently have. Would it be more honest to talk about weather patterns change instead of climate change? I I think the general principle of scientists showing humility is a good thing. And there is re like psychological research showing that when, when scientists are frank about the uncertainties in their science, that, that can actually have a positive effect. Although it's kind of a nuanced thing, it depends on different segments of the audience. But generally, the general principle is I think it's really important for scientists to explain how science works and the more we explain, not just um, the, the findings of science, but the process of science, that, that uh, has a positive, I think, civic effect. Um, so yeah, in general terms, I think that it is important for scientists to show humility, be frank about uncertainty, um, but also explain the concept that science isn't a monolith. We don't understand everything at the same levels. There are areas of high understanding and areas of low understanding and helping the public to understand that is important too. Because scientists, we, we live on the edges of knowledge and that's where our brain is always at. And so we tend to talk about that when we talk about our science to the public. But we also need to remind ourselves that they don't necessarily know the most basic things that we take for granted. So um, I think it is important for scientists to just reiterate settled facts like humans are causing global warming because often the public haven't even heard things that we 
have known for decades. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, John. You have probably made more of an impact in the world on climate change than, than, than my hundred papers on the ice ages. Um, but you know, that over 40 years, but it really is amazing what you've done. And, and thank you for coming so much. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for inspiring us. Hopefully, I know a few people have already um, downloaded the game and I, I, can, I can attest the book is terrific. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was a real honor to be invited to speak and, and it was great to answer all your questions too. And you're welcome to come visit us anytime when you're back in the States. We'll give you a tour of Vermont if you have never been here. As soon as Australians are allowed to leave the country again, I'll, I'll be over there. <laughs> they have you trapped. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone for coming and have a good weekend everyone.